Okay, I want to shoot a quick shop update, kind of let you guys know what's been going on in the shop. A lot has been happening. Say, I have been out of town for the last last week, and Robert has been holding up the fort. And it's interesting how clean the shop is when he's here working and when I'm out. So I guess that means I'm the messy one, because he got this place looking clean. He kept it clean, which I'm thankful for that. He right now, he's out there. This is our current spray booth, and he's out there shooting some lacquer on some ripped white oak. So we did a cabinet job. This is a bathroom vanity and um, we're on the final stretch with that. This is the boxes. All of the fronts are off and getting the lacquer and the drawer boxes are here as well. It's got three drawers right in the middle, a little laundry chute here. So this door folds down, you can drop your laundry in there and then you've got a sink there, a sink there. Uh, this was a, you know, I don't take on a lot of cabinets and um, this was kind of interesting to do because this was the first one where I designed the whole thing in Fusion 360 and cut out all the box parts on the CNC. Uh, and then we basically assembled those and Robert built all the door fronts, drawer fronts, and drawer boxes. Interesting workflow. It's not how I'm used to working, but it was fun kind of figuring that out. I spent a lot of time on the computer dialing in all the CAD stuff, but I learned a lot. And you know, I don't know how many more of these will do, but occasionally we'll throw in a cabinet job because uh, sometimes they can be pretty good money makers. We're also starting up a new dining room table. Um, I'm gonna talk more about this in a little bit. This is another Nakashima style table. I built one of these last year. And um, let's see, we changed the design. This is actually the people I built that one for they're, they're home builders. They build beautiful homes. They're Lindbergh House. I'll link their Instagram. They, they do awesome work. You should check them out. I built one for their personal house, and now they've been referring me to some of their clients, and one of their clients wanted a very similar table. We were going to change the design a little bit. This is going to get an entire build video, so I'm um, just giving you the heads up. This is the start of it. Check out this board we got here. Um, this is, man, you don't find that wide of walnut that often, and it was tricky milling this. We actually had to do some kind of workarounds because this is 20, I think we're around 20, 20 inches wide. The joiner only handles 16 inches. Real quick, I'll show you the process of how we managed to take a board too wide for the joiner, join it and surface it and get it ready for glue up. Yeah, you, that's what I was kind of seeing. It's pretty flat, it's not bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh.
there's a white belt. I'm a little bit quicker. you the walnut board that we milled earlier on the joiner and planter with some trickery there obviously we made an initial cut that was about a quarter of an inch deep a pretty heavy cut and then we just double-sided tape piece of MDF on and that was our our surface to register to run through the planter then we flip it and take off the remaining meat that was left from the joiner and that's it that's how that works if you get really wide above 20 inches which we have done before that's that's a 20 inch planer, then you have to run it through the wide belt, which gives us 43 inches, but it's a lot slower because you're standing instead of cutting. Hopefully that makes sense. So the tabletop is actually glued up sitting right here. You can see uh, that middle board is kind of right there. And we do this in sections because this is a 40, around a 48 inch wide top. So we do two sections and we sand those sections on the wide belt. So these are sanded to 120 actually 150 with the orbital because Robert sanded them and then we re-glue and then we'll take that out of the clamps kind of scrape that joint level and then do the final sanding cut the size and the tabletop is ready for finish so that's the whole process for the tabletop okay so what this is is a this is a kind of a bar stool height table uh, so it's 42 tall um, it's for kind of a meeting space at a business a, a really cool new building um, that's being built in San Antonio and it'll have bar stools at it we're not building those but it has a waterfall grain flow to it but what's so cool and what makes this so difficult is the bottom is shaped with a radius it's going to get painted and then it comes up to this kind of pencil edge right here that will be a clear coat so i mean it's been a month worth of work just to get to this point a lot of steps, a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes. You can probably just see by looking at Bondo some of the issues have, and you're gonna get to see all that in the build video. Uh, but man, I'm so proud of this. I'm proud of the work we put into it and how it's coming out, and I can't wait to put finish on it. Really where we're at with this is, so this edge, we basically glued this top veneered panel onto this bottom frame. And you can see, you know, it's messy right now. We've got epoxy dripped off everywhere. So we just have a lot of cleanup work to do. I'm gonna take a hand plane and basically work this edge down flush to you have this nice transition from the bottom to this edge. So that's the, really the next step. That's gonna be a pretty time consuming process. And, but once that's done, a little cleanup sanding, some filler work, and we can tape this off and start the process of painting this and then shooting a clear coat on this top. And man, it's gonna look awesome once you get the clear coat on that. This, this is actually all milled out of a single slab of wood. Um, so if you look back there, those kind of collection of slabs all came from the same tree. We pulled the best one out of those and we got enough veneers to make both the table and the bench. And the, the tricky thing about this and what you'll see in the video is those are wide. So I think this one here is around 20, 20 inches wide. I can't honestly remember off the top of my head. It's too wide to resaw on the bandsaw, so we actually had to split it right down the middle on the bandsaw, cut the veneers out of the smaller pieces, basically half of it, and then piece it all back together. So it, it, it came out really well. I mean, as you can tell in the video, you cannot see that glue seam. We were managed to get it back together and hide it, so it looks like all one piece has never been cut. We also seamed it here in the middle and made our book match right here. So everything book matches from this point, those two are the same, and then they flow around the top and down to the floor. 
quite an extensive process, a lot of work. It'll be cool to show you guys how we did all that. Uh, and I'm super happy with how it came out. If you remember back about, I don't know how many videos ago, earlier this year, we built some really cool ingrain tables. Well, through the power of the internet and YouTube, I sold another one of those, and um, we're gonna start on it soon. I think I'm gonna do just another build video because it's such a cool, unique piece. This is, uh, live, this is live oak, a live edge live oak. Um, and it's wrapped up. I'm gonna leave it wrapped up because that helps with humidity shifts. But this is gonna get cut out just like the other ones and uh, make a beautiful table. And we, we're gonna be able to keep it the same size, which is good because I can reuse all the old jigs kind of go back through the process. There's a few things I want to improve on these on this table. Um, so stay tuned for that one as well. That is going to be another build video coming maybe next month. Um, but I'm excited to work on that. that piece is actually going to Colorado. So um, there's some things to consider if we're building in Texas and shipping to a mountain town in Colorado with humidity. We'll have to address that and be sure that we uh, think accordingly to that. Things like one thing I want to consider is there's a lot of cracks in this. And typically we would fill that, but I don't think it's a good idea to fill it with epoxy and then send it up to a climate where it's going to be in, you know, seven, five percent relative humidity. I think it's five percent, but I have a book here that will tell me if I can find it. This is a great book, by the way. Every woodworker should read and own this book. It is an amazing book to learn about wood. And I'm going to find this page. There it is. So it has this great chart here that tells me the average temperatures and the approximate moisture content of interior woodwork. This one tells you the average minimum relative humidity. So the small lines is your uh, humidity. We're looking in here in relative humidity of around 45 to 55 in our area. And that's in July which is probably when we're gonna be building this. Head up here to Colorado, I was right. We're looking at around between five and six. Uh, let me see if I got, the, no, I'm sorry. That is moisture content. So in Colorado, you're looking at 25, between 25 and 30% average relative humidity. So there's a bit of a difference there. And so the moisture content you're looking for in interior woodwork in the mountains is five to 6%, which is super low. And here where we are, we're looking at more like 10 to 11%. So because of that, I guarantee you this slab is not dried down to five. It's probably more in the 10 to 11. I need to put a meter on it. In fact, let's just do that right now. Thank you. So hopefully this doesn't become a huge problem. Yeah, that's not good. No, this is, this is way too wet. All right, I got a little bit frightened there because this is, you know, my meter's showing 20, 22 plus percent. Now I bought it from Berdal Sawmill, who I very much trust. Brandon runs that company. He knows his stuff. And I actually just got off the phone with him and he 100% he guaranteed me that this thing is at least 7%. He said they've had it cut for eight years. It's been milled for a long time. It's been air dried and it's been sitting in their climate controlled building. It's been in a kiln as well he feels really good about it being dried. The issue I think, and he was explaining to me because he knows this world much better than me, but this meter is basically, you know, there's several different types of moisture meters you can use. And this is, this is a good meter, but it's calibrated for Douglas fir, which has a much different specific gravity than live oak. Specific gravity, the definition is the ratio of the density of a substance to the density of a standard substance water in the case of wood. Hopefully that helps you out. That kind of goes over my head a little bit. So Brandon told me Douglas fir is down in like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 specific gravity, whereas the live oak is up at 1.2. So that big of a difference makes your, your meter read a lot differently. So this would have to be adjusted by a lot of points to read correctly on live oak. That's what Brandon was telling me. And I knew that about this meter, but I never knew that there was that much of a fluctuation. Um, a lot of this stuff gets complicated, um, and Brandon, that's why I call Brandon, because he knows, he knows this world much better than me. His suggestion and what they do at the mills, they have a pin meter, so it actually has two probes or pins that you can nail into the board, 
and you can measure the moisture content accurately and you can measure it into the depth of the board. So that's what they use. Now for what I'm trying to do in the shop, that doesn't really, that doesn't really work well because you don't want to put big pinholes obviously in a finished board like this. So they, there's, he suggested I get a different meter that you can actually calibrate. This one is specifically calibrated for the Douglas fir. Now it has a chart that you can adjust it with, but it's not going to have live oak on that chart. Now he said Wagner makes one that you can calibrate it to the specific gravity of the wood. So you, if you know the specific gravity, you can type it in, get it calibrated and get fairly accurate read. Feel much better. I was a little stressed out there for a second thinking that we've got to get started on this like next week and knowing that it might have been full of moisture kind of freaked me out. But we're good. We're good to go. So stay tuned to that. Vid but hopefully that build video will go live. Um, I'm thinking probably next month. Mayor's just sleeping. What's up, buddy? Sorry, I didn't mean to wake you up. Okay, real quick before we go, uh, I am, we are working on the, the Nakashima table today, so I wanted to show you the joinery. This is it, we've kind of dry fitted. We still got the top structure to do. Uh, these are half laps right here. And then we've got double mortise and tenon, so this is a test piece. You can see that's kind of how those look. I cut those on this cool little jig here. It can, it can be a pain, but once you dial it in, it works really well. The way we orient, orient these tenons is this way, so we get good glue joints. We have long grain to long grain, and I use double mortise and tenons just because it's stronger. You get more glue surface. Uh, the only disadvantage to this here is that you're cutting at a 15 degree angle, so you're cutting, you've got some short grain, you know, as you cut, the grain's flowing this way. And so we're cutting into that a little bit that way, but you know, the way it's designed and we're going to have a whole structure up top locking it in place. I think it's going to be plenty strong enough. Also, this is a bed Robert's working on. This you probably won't see on YouTube, maybe on Instagram, we might share it. This mesquite came from a friend of mine's ranch and he said, Hey, I need a queen bed. And we kind of matched up these cool book match panels, left a hole there. Robert's micing up. I'm going to let him explain kind of what he's, he's working on this cool joinery. I'm going to let him explain that. If I ever get the mic on. He's still trying to mic up. <laughs> He'll get there. All right, so what we're doing is we routed out this groove that matches the width of the headboard. This will drop in that groove, keep it trapped. And then we're going to put three tenons in here. Uh, we'll leave some space in the bottom two so that the wood can expand and contract some. Apparently mesquite doesn't move a lot. So no, it's very stable. We're still gonna try to account for that. What I'm working on right now is just trying to scribe this into the top of that natural yeah, edge. That's cool, man. So yeah, we so we left the bark edge and he's just basically tracing it and carving it yeah, out. A little more good. work and that should drop in there. Pretty close. Yeah, this is a cool piece. Like I said, we're probably not gonna do a build video on this so this is the only chance you get to see it. Probably we'll post on Instagram a few photos of it, but doing a good job, man. Sweet. Looks good. So that's gonna shut it down for this video. Thanks for tuning in as always. Remember, you can support the channel with merchandise. We've got t-shirts, really cool t-shirts. I think these are pretty cool. Nice hats. Um, I have a Patreon page if you want to go in and help monthly, I would really appreciate that. Plus we have super, I think they're called super thanks. This thing YouTube does where you can hit a little donate button down below the video. Every little bit helps. And I really appreciate you guys. I really appreciate tuning in. You don't have to give me anything. I still would love you guys. And you can leave me a comment. That's enough for me. Just if you have any questions, feel free to ask. As always, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time.